On this Friday night, demands for an investigation. If the Liberals vote this down, it is quite clear that there is a cover-up going on. Was there government pressure to help a Canadian company in legal peril? The minister at the center of the storm broke her silence. But Jody Wilson-Raybould didn't clear anything up. Between uh, starvation and food, but standing, it's a Venezuelan soldier. Food aid is a political weapon. The risks some are taking to speak out. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know the words how to explain their feeling. And in two courtrooms in two cities, justice delivered. But why tonight? There is both anger and confusion. This is the national. Fourteen men, fathers, brothers, husbands, sons, providers for their families and for their communities. They were friends, shoulders for people to lean on, men who loved to laugh, who others were just drawn to. They had talents, interests, art, philosophy, Real Madrid. That's how those who loved and lost them remember them. But those who never met these men know them only for how they died. Bruce MacArthur murdered eight men in Toronto over a seven-year period. Alexandre Bissonnette killed all his victims at once in a spray of bullets at a Quebec City mosque. We knew both would get an automatic life sentence, but for two judges today, the same question. How long should each man have to wait before being eligible for parole? What number would be just? Well, there was uncertainty going into court and coming out, too. In Bissonnette's case, the judge said there could be no justice with the law as it was written. So in a stunning move, he changed it. The end result, Bissonnette won't be eligible for parole for 40 years. And as Alison Northcott explains, that didn't just shock those in the courtroom. It angered many of them. For those whose lives were forever changed by the 2017 attack, today's decision is a painful disappointment. Eamon Derbali was shot by Alexandre Bissonnette seven times. We were astonished uh, and we were very upset after this uh, sentence. And we, we, don't, we don't know how he... he um, he gave this, uh, this sentence. It took more than five hours for Justice Francois Ouat to read his 246-page decision. In it, he said the day of the attack will remain forever written in blood in the history of this city, this province, this country. He said when Bissonnette went to the mosque that night and began shooting, it was planned and premeditated, motivated by a prejudice and a visceral hatred for immigrants who are Muslim. Inside the courtroom, the widows gathered in the front row heard Hua describe their husband's deaths. The emotion was too much for Azadine Sufyan's wife and daughter, who briefly left the courtroom in tears. The Crown prosecutor, survivors and the victims' families had asked the judge for consecutive periods of parole ineligibility. 25 years for each of the men he killed. 150 years would have been unprecedented, but the judge said a sentence without a chance of parole in his lifetime would be disproportionate and cruel. It's been a long and tough process for the victims' families. We want to salute the courage and we wish them well in the future. Since today's decision, it's a very, very long decision by Justice Rutt, we will take the opportunity to read it and see if we will or not go to appeal in this case. Members of the Muslim community say they are shocked and sickened that Bissonnette will be eligible for parole at 67. Very likely these orphans will be still alive and the debate will be open again and they will relive again what we, relive, what we lived today. We were wishing to have the peace of mind and to have these widows and these orphans starting their life in dignity and peacefully and start a new page. Je suis estomaqué. Je suis abasourdi. Je suis choqué. Je sais pas comment exprimer ça, mais je me demande est-ce qu'on est est-ce qu'on est, est, qu est traité De la même façon que les, 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 nos concitoyens canadiens. The judge said Bissonnette's mental state, his anxiety, panic attacks, and suicidal thoughts contributed to his crime. He said the sentence should reflect that he pleaded guilty and expressed remorse.
As he read Bisonette's decision, Uat told him his hate and racism destroyed dozens of people's lives. Their grief now is mixed with new anger and sadness because they feel justice was not done. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Quebec City. First-degree murder in Canada carries an automatic life sentence, but there has been a change in recent years in how long an offender has to wait before applying for parole. And that's where today's confusion seems to lie, because 40 years doesn't seem to fit. We've allowed judges to impose consecutive sentences in case of multiple murder. The change that began in 2011 seemed simple. Before that, whatever the number, multiple first-degree murder sentences were served concurrently at the same time. But since the change, judges can make such offenders serve them consecutively, one at a time, stacking up, so to speak, as long as they were stacked in blocks of 25 years. So 25, 50, 75, and so on. But not today in Quebec City. Justice Francois Huat said 25 years was too lenient, but he thought 50 years was cruel and unusual. So he decided the law was unconstitutional and changed it to allow him to tailor a 40-year sentence, a first for Canada, and immediately open to scrutiny. It means we're, we're probably going to have appeals. Uh, we'll be reading about this for a while. Uh, it'll probably go to the Supreme Court. If it does, the sentence imposed today on Alexandre Bissonnette could itself be re-examined and revisited. Now, in a Toronto courtroom, a different judge wrestled with the same law and came to a different conclusion. Bruce MacArthur will need to wait 25 years before he can apply for parole. And as Joanna Romiliotis tells us, that sentence is getting mixed reaction. In a way, today marked the beginning of the end, the start, perhaps, of some healing. For the friends, the sisters, the brothers, the mother who hasn't said a word. She doesn't have to. The grief is carved on her face. In court, Bruce MacArthur sat expressionless as Justice John McMahon read out his reasons for sentencing. His words often scathing, he called MacArthur morally bankrupt, a sexual predator and killer who lured his victims on the pretext of consensual sex and killing them for his own warped and sick gratification. The men, the judge says, died a slow and painful death, were staged in perverse and degrading fashions, then photographed, only to face even more indignity in MacArthur's hands. The ability to decapitate and dismember his victims and do it repeatedly, the judge says, is pure evil. And yet by pleading guilty to murdering the eight men, the judge pointed out MacArthur spared their families the nightmare of a graphic trial and the killer's age was also a mitigating factor. In what came down to a symbolic decision, the judge ordered MacArthur serve his sentences concurrently, or all at once. If he's still alive, MacArthur will be 91 when he can apply for parole in 25 years, and the judge says his chances of parole are remote at best. The Crown wanted MacArthur sentenced to 50 years without parole. It didn't comment today, but in a statement called the crime one of stark horror, one that offers no closure. Few family members spoke later, as if defeated by it all. Among them, a mother whose family says, can't stop crying. Her husband died of a heart attack after they found out what happened to their son. They lost their son, they lost their husband and uh, brother. They didn't get anything. I don't think he deserves what he got. I think he deserves a lot more harsh of a sentence. This woman knew three of the victims and says the sentence doesn't amount to justice. I don't think that's not enough comfort for the families or the community or the people that he's killed. I, I think that, you know, if you're going to do a maximum crime, you deserve the maximum sentence, which is life times eight. As for police, it's still a life sentence. The only difference is the parole eligibility. And as Justice McMahon said, he can't imagine a parole board ever letting Mr. MacArthur out, even if by some fluke he lives to the age of 91. We don't expect to see Mr. MacArthur in public again. We're satisfied with the sentence. Yes, we are. And with the ending it brings, at least for now.
We were in the courts for years sometimes with a basic murder case. So to have one uh, where someone's charged with eight murders uh, conclude within 13 months of the arrest, you know, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fulfilling. It, it's nice that it is done. This investigation is far from done, so it, it's not done in that aspect, but it is, it is nice to have the court uh, process done. We, like I've mentioned before, we will continue to look at any connection that Bruce MacArthur has to anybody, missing persons, uh, other, you know, we've looked at cold cases. So, Joanna, um, cold cases are still being reviewed, but, but what else is missing in all this? The big, big question is why. Why did Bruce MacArthur go after these men? Why did he start killing? And police don't want to get into the details, but they've had conversations with MacArthur and they plan to have more. And presumably that's to fill in some of the remaining blanks in their investigation. There's still holes as to how he executed his crimes and where they actually all happened. Mm -hmm. And also for the families. The families have a lot of questions and many of them are still very much stuck in this nightmare and knowing why offers them some form of closure. Okay, thanks very much, Rona. You're welcome. So, um, such an emotional day for so many in Toronto and Quebec City. But Ian, you've got the latest in a story that's rocked Ottawa. Well, Andrew, nothing unites political rivals like having the same target. And today, the Conservatives and New Democrats are both demanding a parliamentary investigation. It's in response to a Globe and Mail report that the Prime Minister's office pressured the former Attorney General to intervene in a criminal case involving SNC-Lavalin. As David Cochran tells us, the opposition may be vocal, but the person at the center of the controversy has been mostly silent. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer is calling for an emergency meeting of the Justice Committee. This matter strikes at the very heart of our rule of law. Where conservatives can grill top officials from the Prime Minister's office. Uh, if the Liberals vote this down, it is quite clear that there is a cover-up going on. All this cries out for an investigation. The NDP is on board and also wants an ethics probe. We're asking the Prime Minister if there's been no wrongdoing in this situation to invite the ethics commissioner to have an independent investigation. The opposition is singing the same tune and so is the government. The allegations in the Globe story this morning are false. Uh, neither the, the current, current Minister of Justice or the former Minister of Justice has been pressured or directed by the Prime Minister or anyone in the Prime Minister's office to take a decision in this matter. Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister stated earlier today, the allegations contained in the Globe and Mail the article, article are, are false. Prime Minister, what's your reaction? To but it's not all today, harmony. Please. I don't have any comment. And were you pressured by PMO, ma'am? Anyone at PMO? Jody Wilson-Raybould has refused to back the Prime Minister's assertion that nobody pressured her. Today, she issued this statement. As the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, I am bound by solicitor-client privilege in this matter, which doesn't explain this. I, I want to tell Canadians that, uh, and the Prime Minister has been very clear on this, that nothing inappropriate has happened. David Lametti, the new Justice Minister and Attorney General, has been speaking publicly since this story broke, apparently not bound by anything, telling CBC Radio's The House nothing improper happened. She can put an end to this by saying, I wasn't pressured. So why again, isn't she? Again, I can't, can't speak for her. Uh, the Prime Minister has been clear. I've spoken to my experience. I think Canadians can be reassured that, that, uh, that there has been nothing inappropriate here. But Wilson-Raybould's silence persists. The now Veterans Affairs Minister could make this go away with a single statement denying the Globe and Mail story, a statement she clearly has no intention of making. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. A group of Canadians are also demanding answers from the Prime Minister about an allegation of racial profiling on Parliament Hill. On Monday, there was a lobbying event called Black Voices on the Hill to launch Black History Month. 150 visitors were waiting to meet with cabinet ministers when some employees made them leave. As Hannah Thibodeau tells us, community leaders say they feel victimized by racism. I'm done. I'm done talking. I'm, I'm done being quiet. I've been through this for multiple times. This hurts me. Monday, is... Trayvon Clayton stepped foot into this building for the first time. Went to the parliament building to basically share, share our ideas with ministers and everything to solve racism. But his experience was much different. He says a staffer complained to security about the group as they were waiting for their next meeting. He said, I'm not trying to be racist or anything, but that Daxian group on the floor, floor they, they got to go for an hour or so. 
They can't be here right now. There's, we got noise complaints. They've shared their story and have the support of organizations representing black Canadians. There's quite a lot of sadness, quite a lot of uh, hurt. Uh, there were actually people that were crying. Uh, there was this general sense that, uh, uh, that they, didn't, they, don't, they, they didn't belong. Parliament building is supposed to be for everyone, all of Canada. So it just hurts because it shows that there's racism ran through that building. Yeah, I remember for Halifax. The Speaker of the House of Commons is now investigating and Parliamentary Protective Services has gone one step further. They apologize unconditionally for the incident. They uh, acknowledge that they can do better and that they will do better. Um, they talked about uh, better uh, anti-discrimination training. Clayton wants more, an apology from the Prime Minister. I don't want no letter, because a letter can just be written whatever, whatever. Like I said, I can recycle that. I'll see by body language if it really means something to someone. That, body language tells a lot, so. He's not alone. Others who are on the Hill are calling for a meeting with Justin Trudeau, too. Of a new day begun. No word yet from the PMO, but the Speaker has promised to make his findings public as quickly as possible. Yes. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. It's worth noting the House of Commons adopted a policy in 2014 on preventing and addressing harassment on Parliament Hill. There is a zero tolerance policy for harassment of any kind, including based on race, color, national or ethnic origin. Okay, now let's go to Adrian in Caracas. And Adrian, the development today is about much needed food. Ian, is the ruling party and the opposition grapple for control of Venezuela, there's a new political football on the playing field. $20 million worth of food and medical kits are all desperately needed and they are also tantalizingly, agonizingly close to the people for whom they're intent. <laughs> Truckloads of U.S. aid have arrived at this Colombian border city, but the Venezuelan government forcefully rejects it, has blocked the roadways in. Now that's left Venezuelan migrants with homemade signs demanding humanitarian aid. Now, whenever it crosses the border, depends on the military. This is an opportunity for the Venezuelan armed forces to take part in an admirable humanitarian campaign. Venezuela's opposition appealed to soldiers for the sake of their own families to just let the trucks pass, but embattled President Nicolas Maduro still dismisses the aid as simply part of a U.S. invasion plan. He is boasting that he's collecting 10 million signatures to show Venezuelans don't want American help. And tonight we have a sense of how some suspect many of those signatures are actually being collected. Hunger possibly leveraged for political support. If only Venezuelans could eat the gasoline, they sometimes say here. To note that people pick through the garbage for food is not an exaggeration. And it's not an exaggeration to say those living on the edge are so fed up they're fighting back. That's a small National Guard office some Caracas residents torched a few weeks ago. Neither is it overstating it to call this bag political. A month's supply of food delivered by the government to some six million Venezuelans, some who maintain it's thinner now. No protein, milk or sugar. And if you're this woman, no other option. So how much does this matter to you? Impossible to go shopping. She says you couldn't find three kilos of rice. If you did, it's too expensive. Why hide her face? She says that's a must because something's up with these food deliveries that has people nervous, panicked that they'll be withheld if anyone is critical of Maduro. People say things like, if I don't vote for the government, they won't give me the bag or they'll take my pension. She also says she was asked to sign something curious before getting the bag. They put a paper on top of another paper and get you to sign through it. We were having this conversation when another woman knocked on the door with a warning about more requests for signatures, clearly in support of Nicolas Maduro. What did you do when they asked you to, to sign in favor of Maduro? In all sincerity, I told them, no, I'm not going to sign because I'm not in agreement. I don't support Maduro. I feel they're doing this because they're afraid. They know they're already finished. People are no longer supporting him. Despite her challenge, she still got her food, but knows she's taking a chance speaking out. Food has been weaponized. Which makes Maria Karina Machado utterly fed up. 
not afraid to show her face because she's already a target, banned from leaving the country, from flying within it, and followed constantly, but not silenced. If they have the minimum suspicion that this family is not loyal to the regime, then you will stop receiving food. And they have used it in a very cruel manner because they have, they have chosen people as examples uh, to prove how far they can go. The danger in that, she says, is compounded by the danger hope can sometimes bring. She worries this talk of humanitarian aid at the border is giving people the wrong impression that comfort is a convoy away. Certainly the pressure on the military uh, and I insist from their own families, it's increasing and it's enormous because uh, at the end, what, what is the, the, the image between uh, starvation and food, but standing, it's a Venezuelan soldier. What is he going to do? That's the answer all Venezuelans, especially the hungry ones, are waiting to hear. Mm -hmm. And another daily necessity has been in short supply here. That's reliable electricity. And today that shortage was felt in the halls of power. Casi el 40 of the At a news conference in the presidential palace, Maduro was denouncing the U.S. aid when the lights went out. Last March, Venezuela instituted rolling blackouts, mostly in rural areas, to cope with a crumbling power system. The capital is usually spared, but not always and not today. Opposition leader Juan Guaido also spoke today, telling his supporters that he thinks the Maduro regime is on its last legs, but also cautioning them that he needs them to be patient because he does not suspect that the fall is imminent. So, Ian, that's it for us from here in Venezuela. Back to you with more news of this day. And, Adrian, here are some of the other stories we're following in the national. Donald Trump has set the date and location for his next summit with Kim Jong-un. The U.S. president and North Korean leader will meet in Hanoi, Vietnam over February 27th and 28th. Trump tweeted the news saying he looks forward to advancing the cause of peace. The two leaders held their first historic summit in Singapore last year. Any message for the citizens of Virginia? Uh, we'll have our say on uh, conflict with Turkey. That is Virginia's lieutenant governor, who is again denying sexual assault allegations as a second woman has now come forward. The woman alleges Justin Fairfax sexually assaulted her when they were in college. That is a claim that he calls demonstrably false. All three of Virginia's top officials, all Democrats, are under pressure to resign after a week of political scandal. The governor and attorney general both admitted to wearing blackface in the 1980s. Transport Canada has ordered new safety measures after a deadly train derailment in B.C. Three employees were killed when a freight train plunged off a bridge Monday morning. The train was parked on a steep mountain slope with the emergency air brakes on but started to roll at high speed. Effective immediately, trains must now also apply handbrakes during emergency stops on steep slopes. And this is all that's left of a soccer training center in Rio de Janeiro. After fire tore through a dormitory where teenagers were asleep, 10 boys were killed, at least three others injured. The exact cause isn't known yet. The youth training ground is connected to Flamengo, one of Brazil's biggest and most popular football clubs. The governor has announced three days of mourning. Still ahead on the national, sexting, the National Enquirer, and the richest man in America. Lindsay Duncombe takes us into the politics behind Jeff Bezos' news-making blog post. Plus, planning on watching the Grammys this weekend? If the answer is, meh, you're not alone. But you'll definitely want to watch our pop panel discussion about where things went so wrong for award shows and how they might get back on track. And a beer for Sarah. Officer Sarah Burns was killed in a mass shooting in Fredericton this summer. Today, a local shop honors her with a special brew. We canned it yesterday, and unbelievably, um, we're already over a third sold out, and uh, we're gonna have to hold some back to have it a couple of events because it's gonna be all gone. The National Enquirer insists it has acted lawfully and in good faith in its dealings with Jeff Bezos. But the head of Amazon has told a different tale, alleging attempted blackmail and extortion. 
Yesterday, Bezos posted an unflinching account of the tabloid's threats, including descriptions of the compromising photos of him it claims to have. And now, the Inquirer's parent company may be the target of a federal investigation, embroiled in the heights of Washington intrigue again. Lindsay Duncombe shows us how. Forget, if you can, that this story is about a tabloid threatening to publish a below-the-belt selfie of the richest man in the world, and consider this detail. According to Jeff Bezos, the National Enquirer didn't want money to keep his secrets. Instead, according to what Bezos said was an email from the tabloid's parent company, American Media, what the company wanted was a public statement from Bezos and his security team affirming that they have no knowledge or basis for suggesting that AM's coverage was influenced by political forces. Instead, Bezos did the opposite, exposed not only the apparent blackmail, but made a case for political motivation. The head of American media, David Pecker, has a long history with Donald Trump. And there's no love lost between the president and Bezos, who Trump recently nicknamed Jeff Bozo. He bought the Washington Post to have political influence. He owns Amazon. He wants political influence so that Amazon will benefit from it. In his blog, Bezos also points to the Post's relentless coverage of the murder of its columnist Jamal Khashoggi by Saudi officials and AMI's ties to the kingdom. AMI recently admitted to paying off a Playboy model who says she had an affair with Trump to keep the story hidden ahead of the 2016 campaign. The company is cooperating with investigators, although that deal could be jeopardized if the allegations of blackmail turn into actual charges. The president's reaction? I'm not sure if he's aware of it, and we're not going to get into a conversation about something between Jeff Bezos and a tabloid magazine. Extortion is a crime, and there are reports federal prosecutors are looking into the allegations. AMI says it believes it behaved lawfully in its coverage of Jeff Bezos. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Still ahead on The National, it is award show season, but with controversies plaguing host choices, musicians taking a pass, and declining viewership, our pop panel debates why can't these shows seem to do right? Plus, if you use Spotify, you've probably pressed skip. Deanna Sumanag Johnson shows us how music streaming online is changing how some music is made. When you can skip to the next song without any cost, um, it makes sense that you want your listeners to get to the core of your music as quickly as possible. This sure shows how icy the roads have been in Nova Scotia. Even the salt trucks slipping this morning. One ending up on its side, a second went off a highway and into a ditch. Freezing rain covered much of the province overnight and uh, is expected to return tonight. The prairies are continuing to feel the effects of an Arctic ridge. Extreme cold warnings are in place across Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. Some areas, including Winnipeg, Regina and Saskatoon, could see wind chill values down to minus 50 tonight. And the snow even reached the west coast today, with trucks and cars sliding off roads on Vancouver Island. Up to 10 centimetres fell in some parts, but the big concern tonight is the wind across Gulf Islands and the lower mainland. Gusts of up to 90 kilometres an hour are expected. Environment Canada is warning of potential damage to buildings. We are in peak award season. Sunday is music's biggest night, AKA the Grammys, and the Oscars are just around the corner. There's movie stars and rock stars and hype and gossip and fashion. Look, the celebrity industrial complex is in high gear, but does anyone really care anymore? These big award shows are getting desperate to stay relevant, and it's starting to show. I'm Anthony Oliveira, writer, film programmer, and podcaster. I'm B. Kwame, writer and radio host. I'm Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. I'm an editor at BuzzFeed News. Look, award shows are looking increasingly out of touch, and that's because they haven't kept up with the way we think about culture or the way we consume it. Do you remember the Oscars in their popular film category? Or the time that the Grammys made Alicia Keys do a duet with a hologram? Award shows have tried to capture their audiences, but have missed the mark. 
Shows like the Oscars and the Grammys should have a place in our culture, celebrating art that lifts up, informs, and reflects our lives. So get it together. Everyone deserves a good show. So all you need to do is look at the ratings to see why all these award shows are, are kind of racing to save the furniture. So uh, let's take a look at the Grammys and the Oscars. The Grammys plummeting from a high in 2012 of 39 million viewers, now down to half that number. And the Oscars, almost 44 million viewers in 2014, but losing almost 20 million viewers since then. Uh, worth noting, their Canadian counterparts, the Junos and the Screen Awards, they're also down. But what is the root of the problem and what is the way out? We've convened the panel to discuss that. So, so B, let, let's start with you and let's, let's start yeah. specifically with the Grammys. Mm -hmm. What would you say is their biggest problem right now? Well, you know, it's multi-layered and I don't think that this problem is specific to the Grammys, but I find that with the um, explosion of the internet and social media and the fact that everybody has an opinion you know, your average Joe can determine who's the new pop star. Uh, the Grammys are failing in relevance because they're still um, holding themselves up to this idea of they are the be all end all of who creates the cultural and the musical icons, and that's not true anymore. So there's a big gap between what the Grammy heads think right. and what the general public who tune into it thinks. So, so I guess, yeah, even, even the concept of just having a, a once in a, once a year, the right. sort of big behemoth of an award show weighing exactly. in. I mean, what, what's your take, Elamine? I mean, like, if you think about the Grammys, you know, the most uh, in interesting moment from a couple of years ago was when Adele was, you know, stood and accepted her album of the year um, Grammy, the biggest award of the night. And she was like, this clearly belongs to Beyonce in her acceptance <laughs> speech. Um, what, that, what that says is that there's actually a distance between the way the Grammys think about who should get the Grammys um, and the way the culture understands you know the artists that are actually making an impact um, and the artists that are making an impact now you've never you know you've never you'll never hear of, of them in the Grammy stage because they're all on sound SoundCloud mm -hmm. um, so there's there's this massive difference between the way that we think about you know culture coming kind of top-down um, and us on the internet being able to communicate with each other being like no 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 that is not, you know, the cultural conversation that we're having right now. So frankly, for me, award shows in general, the Grammys especially, mm -hmm. are totally a hate watch. Like, but, I watch them, but I hate <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> but but yeah. the job of deciding, I mean, who ought to win certain awards, it, it's sort of a thankless job to begin with, right? Because no matter what you do, you're, aren't you going to tick some people off one way or the other? And that applies to the Grammys or, or the Oscars. Yeah, I think that um, this sort of problem of demographics is emerging where... Uh, the artists are getting wise to the fact that they don't need these old, straight, white bodies to decide who their audience is. They don't need the centralizing force. Uh, even the, like, Louis B. Mayer created the Oscars so that he could control, have these actors and directors clamoring to make products he wanted to sell. And now that that has sort of evaporated, we're still using a very 20th century model to understand 21st century art. Um, and that's demonstrating itself as a problem, not just at the level of what the audiences want, but thinking that that's your decision to make in a lot of ways. Right. But, but I guess, I mean, so, so if you look at the Grammys again, so mm -hmm. they've, they've done a few things to try to introduce more diversity, right? So, so their diversity task force, I mean, they, they've expanded the voting pool by 900 some people, mm -hmm. which should, should ideally better reflect, uh, you know, a broader range of, of, of voting patterns. They've increased the, the number of nominees in major categories going from five to eight. Uh, Alicia Keys, mm -hmm. you know, a diverse woman herself, she's mm -hmm. going to be hosting right. the Grammys. I mean, these aren't small changes, right? But you know what, I, I think it's too little too late. So this week, we just would have marked, if he was still alive, Bob Marley's for, uh, 74th birthday, sorry, on uh, Wednesday. And Bob Marley never got a Grammy in his life. The icon wow. that he is mm, right. never got a Grammy in his lifetime for all of the music that he put out. So I think that even though there are these changes now, there are a lot of people who have already said, you know, that doesn't matter. Okay, so Anthony then, wh why is it that you have so many people not wanting to touch these award shows with a 10-foot pole? I mean, whether you talk about performers, right? So mm -hmm. Ariana Grande, uh, you know, recently saying, I don't want to perform at the Grammys, and I guess effectively because she felt like they were cramping her style, mm -hmm. but also hosts, right, for yeah. the Oscars. That, that's also been an issue. Yeah. Like, like, what is it about these shows that are kryptonite? <laughs> well, uh, Bruce Valanche, who worked on the Oscars for like 20, 25 years, I don't even know. He probably would be mad about me saying how long it was, but <laughs> he said that anyone who has the skill set to do it is already famous. The only thing that can happen is it goes wrong. Like, if it goes well, everyone says, yeah, he was fine, or she was fine, and if right. it goes 
if, if something goes wrong, it's an albatross around your career for the rest of your life. Like, people watch the Oscars. You're talking about hate watching the Oscars. People watch awards for the moments when things break down. It's oh one of the God, things yes. I love the most about yeah. award ceremonies is because it's like such a long amount of time that it's it allows for a certain amount of pressure on the veneer to crack. And like, <laughs> these people are standing up there and maybe somebody made a mistake and all of a sudden, Jennifer Lawrence or whoever is on stage <laughs> has to deal yes. with the mistake. That's, what's, that's the appeal of the Oscars. Like, these people whose um, personas are so polished exposed to the brightest possible light. And uh, for a host, I mean, that's four hours. Okay, right. but, you, but I mean, you folks would say that, that the awards just aren't even worth what they used to be worth, that the, the cachet or the prestige? You know what, that I'll, I'll give you an example. So this is thinking about the Junos, yeah. right? And we're looking at the Junos that are gonna be coming up in London, Ontario, my hometown. Yeah. And, <laughs> just had to plug that. And uh, this is gonna be the second year that Drake has not submitted sure, his yeah. work to yeah, be considered for nomination. And if we look back, I mean, the Junos have had a really contentious history with black musical artists, hip hop in particular, going back like over 20 years. And Drake hosted in 2011, was nominated, I think, for seven or eight awards, didn't win one, and he's never been back to the Junos again. I think the same principle applies to Ariana Grande and the, Gram and the Grammys, right? Like, mm -hmm. she can tweet to her followers, and they will buy the record, they'll buy the concert tickets. Um, what does she actually get out of the Grammys? Is right. it respect? No, like, that's, she already has that um, from the people who have been following her career for a long time. So, you know, if she's going to come, she, will, she wants to perform the song that she wants to perform. Right. And if they say no, it's like, why, why would I even bother? Yeah. What do I get out of this? Right. I and think that's fair. The broader trend in culture, like you see Taylor Swift not signing with Spotify until she gets a contract that she wants. You see Tidal emerging as sort of like a creator-driven yeah. mm -hmm. project. Like the question is increasing, like who are you to tell me whether or not my art is worth awarding? Yes. So, so, so real quick go around because I, I want to wrap this on on as productive a note as we <laughs> possibly can because it's easy to poke holes in things. Right. right? Yes. So, so I mean, if I give you ten seconds each how you would improve these award shows, be they the Grammys or the, or the Oscars or what have you. The first thing that you do <laughs> is get a host that is relevant to people. Um, and I think it's very telling, particularly for the Oscars, that you know, with the whole controversy, they couldn't find a single person to come up and They've say, decided to go hostless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a young comedian who's actually able to communicate with people who has a successful Netflix special, you know, like a John Mulaney, right. uh, might be more relatable to people Nicole than- Nicole Byer. Right, 100%. Can I just say for the record, going hostless, yeah. terrible idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, gonna, uh, not, gonna not go that well. I have any <laughs> yeah. vested interest no, in that. You do a little. Uh, right. uh, Anthony, how would you improve these shows? Yeah, I think that hostlessness is an interesting concept to think about because in some ways I think that the audience has become its own host. They engage with the show as much or as little as they like. They're tweeting about it. They're like checking out Tumblr. They're just watching clips. Like if you're there for the four hours, great, but some people are just sort of waiting for their own sort of level of engagement. I think so much, even these charts we look at, like, Nielsen ratings, Nielsen families are not a thing of the past. And like people yeah. are consuming these in lots of different ways. And they need to rethink, well, is the best way to air this in a four hour chunk advertised to mm. heck? Like, is that really what we want to do? Or should it be something that is already sort of curated in advance for audiences? Yeah. B, you get the last word. Yeah, I think something personal for me when I think especially about the music awards like the Junos and the Grammys, a lot of music now is coming out of what seems like underground movements. So we've got, you know, the world music categories. There's a reggae category. There's no dance hall category. There's no soca. There's no Afrobeat category. And these are genres that are changing the world, right? Dance hall birthed the idea of Tropical House, which made Justin Bieber have, you know, a new phase of his, in his career. Thank God for that. But, yay, yay for <laughs> Justin Bieber. But taking it back to the originators, there's nowhere for them to receive that recognition. You guys are, all that being said, still gonna watch? These you said hate watch. I'm gonna hate watch, I'm gonna hate tweet the whole time. Anthony? I'm actually hosting at TIFF okay. for their party this year, so I also have a, a horse in the race about hosts. Yes. See? I will be watching mainly on Twitter. So, All right. that's it. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be watching. Anyway, next on The National, how skipping songs on streaming services is changing the way some music is made. I kind of call it like microwave music sometimes, you know what I mean? People just want things to happen instantaneously. They want, you know, to stream things instantaneously. So that just goes to show the attention span of like today's youth. I hope that sometimes I won't. Yeah. I feel good sometimes I don't. But first, a quick preview of a story we'll have for you in the coming days on The National. 
It's a fix for seniors who fall, a look at the science of preventing them and the struggle to recover. Erin Harris was fit and active all of her life until a tumble down a flight of stairs changed that. I was walking five miles a day forever and it went down to one street. Three. It took her several weeks to recover from a broken ankle, but it took her years before she felt safe enough to reclaim her old life. Now she's determined not to have it happen again. I decided to train like an athlete again, and that meant anything and everything that was offered to me. The Grammy Awards are this Sunday, and since most of the nominees are the most popular, that means they get a lot of plays on streaming services. Just like AM radio a generation ago, online services like Apple Music and Spotify have changed the industry from the way people find and listen to new music. And it also affects how artists make money. In the first half of 2018, streaming made up 75% of music industry revenues in the United States. And that, in turn, is affecting music itself. Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us how. You want it lower? Or we could do it if it were like, out in Mumbai, sparking my tie. This is songwriting in the age of streaming. There's the usual concerns, the lyrics, the melody. We'll save it for later, yeah. I like the treatment you're putting on there. Can I do one more? Mm -hmm. And okay. some new ones. Really, the like ways that, that streaming has affected my writing is trim the fat. <laughs> I just shorten intros. This musicologist's research backs up her instincts. Hubert Lavelle Gauvin looked at 303 of the top 10 songs released between 1986 and 2015. One of his main findings? Songs used to take their time to get going, with instrumental intros as long as 20 or 25 seconds. Nowadays, they're on average only five seconds long. This is a big difference, but this makes a lot of sense in terms of, of uh, online streaming. You know, when you can skip to the next song without any cost, um, it makes sense that you want your listeners to get to the core of your music as quickly as possible. Other experts have pointed out streaming hits are also a bit shorter overall. Collaborations of multiple artists are popular. And the choruses occur much earlier in the song, but they're more mellow and less obvious. Choruses that aren't huge and hit you in the face, like anti-choruses are really becoming a thing. This isn't the first time the way music is consumed has affected how music is written. As we count down the 40 hottest hits in the USA. Top 40 radio also had its own songwriting conventions. But can writing a song that streams well be good for the art? Multiple Grammy and Juno winner Sarah McLachlan isn't so sure. If people are writing music for that particular format, then I find that sad because as an artist, I've always been allowed to speak my truth. Do you want reverb? Back at the songwriting session, producer Michael Goldchain agrees. Sometimes you'll be working on an idea and you kill it before it even becomes a real idea just because you're like, oh, this isn't going to fit onto anything, any playlist. See those knees fly, I'm at you with my third eye. But he, like most musicians his age, still yeah. thinks the benefits of streaming outweigh the problems. No music label, no radio DJ needed to reach millions of listeners. Deanna Subanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah. Well, next on The National, the Fredericton shooting shocked a community last summer, then brought it together. In our moment, how one Fredericton business is honoring the memory of a fallen police officer. When this tragic thing happened, um, it was just amazing to see how Fredericton was there for each other. After tragedy struck Fredericton last August in the form of a mass shooting, the community looked for ways to try to deal with its grief. Four people were killed, including two police officers. Now one of them, Constable Sarah Burns, has inspired a novel idea to honor her legacy. It involves beer, a pale ale, Grimsby, made in Sarah's memory and named after her beloved racehorse. And that story 
is our moment. We uh, d designed and brewed a beer to help raise money for the Sarah Burns Police Memorial Fund. I wanted to do something. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. My sister um, knows Sarah, knew Sarah well, uh, and I knew that Sarah was a wonderful person. Sarah is a part of our community, and, and you know all the police uh, in our community are there for our community. And craft beer is supported by our community. It's a very community thing. 100% of every penny that comes in to us is going to go to the Sarah Burns Police Memorial Fund. We're already over a third sold out and uh, we're going to have to hold some back to have it a couple of events because it's going to be all gone. When this tragic thing happened, um, it was just amazing to see how Freighton was there for each other. It's community, it's, it's stepping up to help other people, um, and we're just one of the channels among many that are helping to make this happen. And Andrew, I was wondering if maybe some people watching might be thinking, well, is beer really the right way to honor a fallen police officer? Sarah's husband, as, as we know in our notes, uh, actually says that, that he was quite moved by this because it really shows not just the craft brew maker, but also the community really cares. Yeah, indeed. And, and I, I will say the, the part about this story that, that I actually like quite a bit is the fact that when he says all of the proceeds uh, go to that fund, he really means it. A, a whole team of people got together, you know, from graphic designers, people in packaging, they all got together, donated their time. But even New Brunswick Liquor isn't even taking its customary cut, of, you know, of, of the sales. So truly every penny goes to that memorial fund. That's The National for this Friday, February 8th. Have a good night. Good night.